is with any skill. The tricky part of meditation is to get a sense of just right, to get a feel for the practice. How hard to push things. Because sometimes the mind responds. You push it and push it and push it and things get better. Other times it rebels, which means you have to step back and watch for a while. As the Buddha says, there are two types of problems in the mind. Some problems go away when you just watch them with equanimity. In other words, they exist as problems because they're hidden from you. But if you watch them carefully for a while, you see them and you see right through them. You understand where this comes from, why you don't want to get involved, and it just falls away. There is that kind of problem. And then there are the other problems that go away only when you, when you fight them. And as with fighting any enemy, first you have to understand your enemy. Which means, again, you have to do some watching. You can't just go in with your ideas of what you want out of the situation and enforce it that way. Because the mind is complex. So you watch it, and then you experiment to see what works and see what doesn't work. The Buddha talks about exerting a fabrication. That's his way of expressing the idea of putting an effort into the practice. And there are different ways that we fabricate our experience. The way we breathe is one way of fabricating our experience, so that's one way you can test things. What happens if you breathe in a different way? And then there's the way you direct your thoughts and evaluate things, the questions you ask about the situation. Sometimes we're asking the wrong questions. This is one of the skills that the Buddha had to teach his students and teach his listeners as well. Many times people would come to him with all the wrong questions. He was teaching them an end to suffering. And there's one famous case where monks said, look, I'm not going to practice your teachings until you explain to me whether the world is finite or infinite whether it's eternal or not eternal, whether the soul is the same thing as the body or something different from the body. When a person gains awakening, does that person still exist or not exist or both or neither? And the Buddha refused to answer those questions because the mindset that wants to answer those questions pulls you away from the actual prospect of looking at what's going on right in the present moment to seeing what you're doing how you're causing suffering, how you might stop causing it. So if you find yourself with a problem in the mind, ask yourself, well, what questions am I asking here? Maybe I'm asking the wrong questions. Try to think in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Where is the stress? What's causing the stress, i.e., what's arising with the stress and passing away when the stress passes away? What qualities can I be developing so I could see these things more clearly? Those are the appropriate questions. And part of your skill as a meditator is learning how to derive from those basic questions the questions that's just right for your particular problem. And then there's finally is there what the Buddha calls mental fabrication, which are feelings or perceptions, your the images you have in your mind, the labels you apply to things. For instance, when you're focusing on the body, sometimes your idea of focusing on the body just puts too much pressure on the breath channels. So the minute you focus, you've got a problem. Well, is it possible to stay aware of the body without putting any pressure on any part? Change your perception of what it means to be focused. When I was first studying with a John Fuang, he would often use the, the Thai idiom. He'd say, catch hold of the breath. And so I tried to catch it, and I found myself actually tensing up in the body, trying to catch hold of the breath. One day as I was meditating, I realized that if I could relax around the breath and not try to catch it, it went much better. 
So I took him to task. I said, when you tell me to catch the breath, it's the wrong thing to do. Unless if I had to catch it, I tense up around it. He laughed and he said, well, that's not what he meant by catching. What he meant was that you watch it continuously. You follow it continuously. Keep track of it. In the same way that you want to say, keep track of the motions of a mouse through a maze. If you pin the mouse down, you can't see what the mouse, <coughs> how the mouse is going to negotiate the maze. So you have to figure out how, what's the right amount of pressure to apply to this. And what is your perception of what it means to breathe? There's the in and out breath, which feels one way, and then there's just the energy in the body. That also is a form of breath. And how do you perceive the impact of the in and out breath on the rest of the body? Is it something you have to push into the body? Do you have to push it through something to get it in there? If you have that perception, it's going to create a lot of tension in the body. Think of the breath simply suffusing the body. It comes in through the fingertips, comes in through the toe tips, comes in through all the pores of the skin. So it swells the energy you've already got and then allows it to relax. Swells it again, allows it to relax. Holding that perception of the breath has a can have an impact on the mind, a much more refined impact. Because what you're trying to do is learning how to stay here with the minimum amount of effort so you can stay here for a long period of time. So the effort is continuous, unwavering, but not weighing you down, not exhausting you. That requires getting the sense of what's just right, a feel for the practice. So as we meditate, we're experimenting to find what works and what doesn't work. And so be willing to sit through some periods when it's not working so you can figure out what it means not to work and why it's not working. But at the same time, remind yourself there are these ways of asking questions, different ways of approaching the, pra the practice, approaching the way you focus on the breath. In terms of bodily fabrication, the in and out breath, verbal fabrication, the way you focus on things and the questions you ask about it and how you evaluate it. And then finally, your feelings and perceptions. What feelings in the body do you allow to stay the way they are, and which feelings do you try to clamp down on? Maybe you should adjust the way you relate to your feelings. Change your perception of where the mind is in the body and what it does when it focuses, and see how these things have an impact on the mind's ability to settle down, have a sense of ease, well-being, fullness, refreshment, as it stays here in the present moment. Because the instructions you get in the books and the instructions you hear in Dharma talks are basically general principles. And it's up to you to figure out how to apply those principles in a skillful way to what your particular problems are right now. Because the way you relate to the body, the way you relate to the movements of the mind, is something very personal and individual. It's hard to get words for that sense of your awareness in the body. Dogen has a passage where he says, when you're sitting here, is it the mind sitting in the body? Is the body sitting in the mind? What's doing the sitting? The questions may sound strange, but as you look at the way you relate to things, you realize they are very relevant to how you're relating to the present moment. So you've got to take the words and adjust them to what your problems are and to get a better sense of what the problems are. And John Fuhrman would often say that when the Buddha talks about right view, right resolve all the way down to right concentration, think of it in terms of just right. And it's up to you to gain that sense of just right as you get more and more sensitive to the practice. <laughs>